What does it cost? Important question to ask when you're going shopping. Especially when your wife is going shopping. What does it cost? We have Thanksgiving coming up, which means Black Friday is on the horizon. I've already seen all the Black Friday sales out, right? I don't know why they're on sale when it's not Black Friday yet, but they're already on sale and they're saying more good sales are coming. And um, You know, it's always kind of this, this thing where they say, well, it's really, it's worth this much, but I've gone crazy and I'm going to give it to you for this. And, you know, kind of really pushing and, and getting people to, to buy and to spend just a lot of money on stuff they don't need. A Black Friday sales. You know, what does it cost? How much is it worth? You know, first thing I, I want to say right off the bat is these people are not crazy. They're greedy, and they're trying desperately to get our money. So don't fall for the lie of, oh, my manager, he's just gone nuts, and he's slashed all the prices. You need to come in and buy all this stuff immediately. They just want your money. Secondly, the more practical way of looking at things, it's worth whatever you want to pay for it or willing to pay for it. I don't care what the MSRP number is on the item, on the car, or whatever it is. It's only worth it if you're willing to pay for it. And finally, I would say that there is nothing in those stores that is worth me waking up in the middle of the night and standing in line <laughs> for the hope that I might possibly get it. But come Friday, my plan is to sleep in and maybe do online shopping. I mean, that's, that's the way to do it. Do it in your PJs. You get all the Black Friday deals. It's a wonderful thing. What does it cost? What is it worth? That's a really important question when we come to things. And really, our answer to that determines how we view everything, whether we think that it's worthy of our attention or not. I want you to turn with me to Isaiah 52. This morning, we are going to cover one of the most significant passages in the book of Isaiah. This passage influences so much of the New Testament that it's going to be impossible for us to dive in as deeply as we could into all the ways that the New Testament sees Jesus as fulfilling this passage. But this morning I want us to look, instead of at all the specific details, to look at the cost of grace. The cost of grace. What did it cost for us to have the grace of God? I really do believe that a lot of people who profess to be Christians do not follow Christ and are not willing to make the sacrifices that are necessary to be a Christian because they devalue the cost of grace. They devalue the cost to Jesus that we might be forgiven. So as we go into this passage we're going to see what the cost of grace is. It cost us nothing. But it cost Jesus his glory in his very life. There is nothing more valuable in all of heaven and earth than the grace of God. For there has never been a price as steep as what was paid that we might be forgiven. Please pray with me and we'll ask the Lord to speak to us. Lord God, you are the wonderful, merciful Savior. You are majestic and holy. You dwell in light that we cannot approach. You are the one that no man can see and live. You are the holy God, and yet you have graciously and lovingly pierced through the darkness and brought your light to us. What else is needed than that for us to be a people of thanksgiving and joy? We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the sacrifice that you made on the cross to save sinners like us. I pray that as we study this passage that we would this morning have open eyes, open ears, and open hearts to understand further the depths of your sacrifice that we might understand greater the depths of your love that our hearts might be changed that we might live more faithfully for you please glorify yourself through this passage through this sermon 
Please speak, Lord God, for we need your word to breathe life into us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah 52, starting in verse 13, we'll be covering all of chapter 53. Uh, Isaiah has been working us towards this servant. We've seen these servant songs, chapter 42, chapter 59, or 49 and chapter 50, uh, of God saying salvation is coming, redemption is coming, I'm going to do it through this individual, this servant. We've seen different aspects of his life. We've seen that he's going to do it without uh, violence. We've seen that he's going to be rejected, but he's going to stand firm and, and trust in, in the Father. We've seen that suffering will be a part of his ministry, but here we see in fullness how the servant brings salvation. We're going to see that the path to glory for the servant and for those who follow him is a path that leads through death itself. So start with me in verse 13 of chapter 52. We read this, Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many people were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man, in his form more than the sons of man. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what they had not been told, for what had not been told them they will see, and what they had not heard they will understand. Who has believed our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. So let's stop there. God last week was calling the saved to depart, to get up and get out of Babylon, to be willing to separate from the impurities of this world. That's part of what salvation is, the salvation from our sins to a holy life. But then he shifts immediately to how that's going to happen, how we can even be a saved people, be a victorious people who can go out of darkness into light. And he moves back to his servant. He says that his servant's going to prosper. This is a specific Hebrew word that uh, doesn't simply mean by bl blind luck he's just going to happen chance fall into success. It's a Hebrew word that means that he's going to achieve his purposes through wisdom and insight. So the servant is going to accomplish his goal intentionally through his own wisdom and insight. He is going to prosper. He's going to be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. This is, this is a glorious picture of the servant. High and lifted up, greatly exalted. One who's going to accomplish his purposes because of his wisdom, because of his insight. And then we move to, chapter, to verse 14 where it talks about his appearance being marred more than any man. Uh, a way that we could understand that phrase is to say that he will be so disfigured that he won't even look human anymore. We go on into chapter 53 where he talks about how his form and his appearance are just, it was nothing important for us to look at, nothing that was attractive to us. We'll come back to that word in just a moment. But it's not attractive, it's nothing to look at because it's so disfigured and so horrific that nobody wants to look at it. And so we have this contrast of a servant who's going to be high and lifted up and greatly exalted, glorious, prosperous, victorious. So disfigured that he doesn't even look human anymore. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, they used a specific word to translate lifted up. And when we read the Gospel of John, John uses that word when he tells us Jesus' statement in chapter 12 when he says, And I, if I am lifted up, will draw all men myself 
the painful, absolutely painful thing about our salvation and the grace that we have received is that it required, demanded, necessitated Jesus stepping down from glory, taking on flesh in the role of a servant whose job was to die in a horrendous way. Jesus' role, his way of bringing about salvation in this grace that we sing so much about was to let go of his glory and to become a servant who was obedient even unto death. And not just any death, not a noble death, not an easy or peaceful death, death in the most horrendous and horrific way that the Romans knew how to do at the time. So much so that they were baffled by him. It says in verse 15, he'll sprinkle many nations, indicating that uh, a priestly uh, function for the servant, he's going to bring about purity for the nations. The kings are going to shut their mouths on account of him because what they hadn't been told, well, they'll see, but what uh, what they had not heard, they'll understand. But then he goes on immediately to say, but who's believed our report? Who's believed our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? If you go back on what we covered last week in chapter 52, verse 10, it says that God bared his holy arm in the sight of all the nations. So to to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It's been revealed to all the nations. God has made it clear. He has shown his son, displayed him publicly on Calvary, written in three different languages. This is the king of the Jews hanging over his head on the cross. But who has believed? This is what he says we have done with him, even though he's grown up like a tender shoot. Look at this image, a root out of parched ground. There shouldn't be anything growing out of a parched and desolate earth. But, but the Messiah grows up this life in a desolate place. That's who he is before God. But this is what we think about him. We don't like him. It says that, that his appearance uh, was something that we should not be attracted to him. That word attracted, it's used primarily in the Old Testament to refer to coveting. And in Isaiah, it's only used three times. It's used here and then two other times. In both places, it's used about idolatry, the attraction to idols. In other words, the appearance of Jesus, this servant is going to be unattractive or undesirable to idolatrous hearts. Before God, he's like a root growing up out of parched ground. He's something that brings life out of death, but when men look at him because of the wickedness of our hearts, we don't like him. It says he was despised and forsaken of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted, literally knows sickness, acquainted with grief. Like one from whom men hid their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Paul says in Philippians 2 that Jesus not considering equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he'd emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant. We need to step back and realize that God's grace required the Son of God, the Logos who spoke all things into existence, the Almighty One, to step down out of heaven and to be born and placed in a manger. The star-breathing God to endure the insults of wicked men. He wasn't merely rejected by people who didn't know him. He was rejected by his own people whom he created for his own glory. And on the cross, he witnessed his creation despising him and esteeming him as nothing. And his glory was cast down. And he died. As a nothing Jew that the Romans just decided to crush. The cost was great. It didn't just cost Jesus his glory, it cost him his life. Verse 4. See the reason for the cross 
It wasn't that this servant was just a wicked man who deserved what came to him. It says, surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Chastening for our well-being, for our peace, fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that has led to slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation who considered that, that he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of, the, of my people to whom the stroke was due. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. So we read he's a man of sorrows, he's a, he knows grief, uh, he knows those things, he, he, he bears that sickness because he bears our sickness, he knows our sorrows, he carries the weight of our transgressions and our iniquities, that word iniquities, it doesn't simply refer to the act of evil, it refers to the guilt that arises because of the act of evil. So it's not just that Jesus died because we do bad things. Jesus died because that's what we deserve. That's the weight of our sin. Sin demands death. Jesus went to the cross because we deserve the cross. And he decided to bear it for us. Notice this reversal. You know, it says that, uh, that, that Jesus, his tomb was assigned with, with wicked men, but he was with a rich man in his death because he'd done no violence. There's no deceit in his mouth. In other words, and we see this in the gospel story, you have these uh, people who have who condemned him to die as a criminal on a cross. So he's going to go to the graves of all the wicked people, of the common people. But a reversal happens in Jesus' death where Joseph of Arimathea takes him and places him in, a, it's a borrowed tomb because he doesn't need it for very long, but places him in a rich man's tomb. There's this, this, this role reversal to where he's not where they said he should be, but he's where he should be because he was innocent. And, and notice how he says that, that uh, while God was striking him, uh, he was doing it for our griefs, bearing our sorrows. But verse 4, we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. We, we looked at him and said, well, God's cursed him. He's a sinner. If you're really who you say you are, come down from the cross, then we'll believe in you. You deserve it. You should be up there. This is how Isaiah says, we viewed Jesus on the cross. Verse 8. Who among his generation, who there at the cross mocking him, who there at the trial crying out, crucify him, who there would have possibly considered this, that he was cut off from the land of living, that he was put to death for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due, who deserved what was happening to him. Nobody considered that in that moment. The disciples just figured that Jesus was failing. The, 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 the chief priests, they just figured that they were succeeding. But nobody thought Jesus on the cross is dying in my place for my sin. But Isaiah says this is exactly why he died. That we might be forgiven. God took the weight of our iniquity and placed it on Jesus on the cross. And Jesus gave up his life not because he was a failed Messiah, not because he was a weak Savior. He died on the cross willingly because it's what we deserve. Sin brings death always 
and the grace of God to forgive us of our sins cost Jesus his life. Not just a man, but the Son of God gave up his life that we could be forgiven. Grace cost him much. And it cost us nothing. Absolutely nothing. Let's, let's finish this passage. It says, verse 10, But the Lord was pleased to crush him. Just stop and think about it. The Lord was pleased to crush This is my servant. Huh? He's going to prosper. He's going to be high and lifted up, highly exalted. The Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, literally making him sick. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So here we're back down, back to where we started, prosperity. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong. Because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. So the servant, and this is where the New Testament just makes a ton of sense. The servant is dead. He's in a tomb. But now all of a sudden, he has an inheritance that he's going to share with people. I mean, how do you have that without a resurrection? This is where the Jews really got off on their ideas of the resurrection. I mean, you cannot have a dead person giving out stuff. If you do, I mean, that's where the zombie apocalypse has happened. And it just, we, we, we put that in sci-fi. That, that's just not what happens. If he's giving out stuff, that means he's come back to life. So we have here a prophecy of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus that God was pleased to crush him. God was pleased to put our sickness on him, the guilt of our sins upon him. And Isaiah says that if the servant's willing to do these things, again, Jesus, he's, he's not an unwilling victim, but he's a willing sacrifice. If he's willing to do this, to pour himself out, then he will receive the blessings of prosperity, he will receive the inheritance of basically everything. And, and I want to point that out there in verse 12. It says, I will allot him a portion with the great. He will divide the booty with the strong. The word allot and divide is the same word in Hebrew. Uh, it's just changing subjects. God's saying, I will basically share the inheritance with him. I'll apportion the inheritance to him. And then he'll take what is his and he will apportion that with others. Jesus, as a reward or a result of his death, is exalted to glory to become the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, who inherits everything. And the result of that is that he then is, shares that inheritance with us. He justifies the many and intercedes for the many. So the result of all of Jesus' work, of all of his suffering, of being disfigured beyond recognition as a human, the result of his being completely rejected by man, the result of, of him being put to death unjustly, unfairly for the sins of other people, the result of all of that is that we profit. We benefit. Jesus takes what we deserve so that we can get what he deserves. That's grace. It cost us nothing. But we get everything. And I think that we have to recapture this understanding of grace and have to understand the cost to Jesus of grace if this grace is going to begin to change our lives. I think that there's a really big difference between doing things because you have to do things and doing things because you get to do things. When I was 
trying to become a pastor. I was working very hard at school, and I had to do a pastoral internship. It's the only way I could get my degree, and it's the only way I could really get my foot in the door to it really didn't do me any good for coming out here uh, as far as uh, resources go or, or networking goes, but uh, it's something I had to do. And unfortunately, I had a very good pastor, and he, he had me study a lot of books and had me do a lot of ministry and counseling and witnessing and, 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 and just all the, the, the stuff that pastors have to do. And it was miserable. I kept thinking, I don't want to do this, but I have to do this. Read, I don't want to read this book. Well, he said, I've got to read this. There's a lot better books I could read than this one. And so I thought of my, my young arrogance. I had to do it, though, so that I could get the degree, so that I could get finished school, and so I could become a pastor. Today, by God's grace, I'm a pastor. And guess what? All that stuff that I had to do, I now get to do. And it's the exact same stuff, reading books and studying so I can give you God's word, doing counseling and witnessing, all the administrative stuff. I'm, I'm, it's all the same stuff he had me do, but the difference is position. At that point, I had to do it if I was going to get what I wanted, but now I'm simply privileged to be your pastor and to get to do what your pastor gets to do. Same task, different position. And I think a lot of people look at Christianity, they look at it and they say, well, it's, it's all this stuff I have to do or all this stuff that I'm just not allowed to do. And they don't understand grace. They don't understand what God has done for us. They don't understand that God in Christ Jesus has made us a new creation, has made us positionally His children. And now we get to live for our Father who is in heaven. Now we get to come out of the darkness and be free of our sins. Now we get to live the holy life that God always intended humanity to live from the very beginning. We get to do these things. God has given this to us. It cost us nothing to get the privilege of being able to fulfill what our souls want, and that's to live for God. Grace costs us nothing, but it costs Jesus everything. And I think, I truly believe that we need to recapture the sight of Jesus on the cross if we're going to ever recapture holiness in the church. People don't like the cross. They don't like the, the image. They much rather have the picture of Christmas, right, with baby Jesus in, in, in the manger and the sweet nativity scenes. They much rather have that than the horrific crucifixion scenes of Easter. And I think it's because it reminds us of how weighty our sins are. Listen to me. God was not going to pay more than your sins deserve. God was not going to overdo it saying, I, you know, I'm not sure. So I you know, better be safe than sorry. You know, sorry, Jesus. I'm going to give you more than they probably deserve. Their sins aren't that bad. I just I want to really make sure that we're safe here. God doesn't do that. God gave our sins exactly what they deserve when Jesus died on the cross. That's the weight of our sin. And we don't like the cross because when we look at the cross, we see what we deserve. And we hate that. But when we refuse to either repent of our sin or to even acknowledge our sin, listen to me. We are devaluing the grace of God, saying Jesus' blood just isn't worth that much. What did it cost for you and for me to be forgiven? It cost him his glory. It cost him his life. And yes, God glorified him with the glory that was his from the foundation of the world. He was exalted up to the heavenly places to take his seat at the right hand of God forever. Yes, all of that happened, but he still stepped down out of heaven and he gave up his life. That's the cost. What is the cost of your salvation? Is Jesus crucified? So what is it worth to you? What are you willing to pay? What are you willing to, to do? What are you willing to give? What are you willing to sacrifice? And you may say, whoa, preacher, you said it costs us nothing. I thought we, you know, we had a free gift here. But grace cost us nothing. But I also want to remind you, I really doubt anybody sees that cancer-free diagnosis as a big loss. 
And when grace comes into our lives and removes the cancer of sin from us, we shouldn't see it as a big loss either. Oh, I don't get to do those things. What do you mean you don't, you don't get to do? You don't have to do those things anymore because you're a believer in Christ Jesus set free. It costs you nothing to be set free so you can live in holiness. It's a privilege, not an expense to live out the life that God has called us to live. So yes, what is it, what is it worth to you? Are you willing to lose your sin? Are you willing to lose your guilt? Are you willing to lose death? And let Jesus take all of that stuff so that you can gain what's rightfully his? That's the call to Christ. That's the Christian gospel. And whenever we choose our way over his, we belittle it saying, oh, it wasn't really that much. Whenever we choose sin over holiness, we belittle it and say, oh, Jesus, he, you know, he was just a good example. Yeah, he died on the, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that much. Or we look at it and say, no, you know, that's not me. He didn't do that for me because, honestly, I just need a slap on the, the, the wrist, not nails in the hand. That, you know, I'm just, it's not that bad. Look at the cross and see how much it cost. And start living your life in view of the weightiness of the grace of God. Let's pray. Lord God, I, I confess to you, and I feel that I can speak for all of us here, that we often belittle the grace that you have given, that we daily, when we choose sin over holiness, treat Jesus with disrespect, and I pray for your forgiveness, and I ask that you would open our eyes to see how much... Our salvation cost the Lord Jesus that we might strive to live lives worthy of the cost. Thank you for freeing us from our sins. But I pray, Heavenly Father, if there's a person in this room who is still enslaved to sin, that you would in this moment speak to their hearts and open their eyes that they may no longer esteem Jesus as nothing, but that they might see him as everything and trust in him is everything. Please, Lord God, glorify your name as we respond to your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Final point I want to make. Did you notice how he switched to we when we got to chapter 53? We esteemed him as stricken and smitten of God. We were not attracted to him. We we, we, this is Isaiah talking. The prophet of God who's seen the glory of God, and yet he's still willing to say we. Why? I think it's because we view Jesus as less than he really is. Christian, we fail to see him for who he really is. We do it every day in our lives when we commit sin instead of the holiness that he calls us to do. We do it every time when we decide that our way is more important than God's way and our wants are more important than God's will. We do it all the time. We look at Jesus and we say, he's just not that much. We look at ourselves and say, this is where it's at. We, Christian, let's be humble enough to confess that today. Let's be humble enough to give full thanks and glory to Jesus Christ who paid the greatest cost to save this. We have esteemed him as nothing. Let us today in this place choose to glorify him as everything. Stand with me and let's sing.